Thank you, Irene. Uh, Dr. David Poulin is a physicist whose research focuses primarily on finding efficient, effective methods to protect quantum information. And this is, of course, in anticipation of the quantum c computing revolution that's already begun, where quantum computing devices will change the face of computation as we know it. Protecting information in that area is not surprisingly going to be as much of a challenge as it is today. And the fact that uh, CIFAR provides opportunities for young researchers to mix with experienced members uh, in their field led Dr. Poulin to a situation a while ago rarely afforded young researchers. At a CIFAR meeting, he said some provocative things about quantum mechanics, which prompted a challenge from a Nobel laureate. I wasn't there. Uh, Dr. Poulin apparently responded directly and survived. <laughs> and he's now co-director of the Quantum Information Science Program. Please welcome Dr. David Poulin. Bonsoir. Thank you, Jay, for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to describe to you what my day in the office looks like. Uh, <clears throat> there you go. So, uh, yeah, so when I come in my office and let's say I don't have any pressing obligations, I like to just stand at the board and scribble some equations. And these help me uh, come up with new quantum software. So this is what my board looked like earlier this week. In this example, I was, I was considering a very common task in machine learning called stochastic gradient descent. We're using a lot of computer power to solve that particular problem currently. And I was trying to figure out if uh, this problem could benefit from a quantum computer, if we could accelerate this. Uh, and I failed. I haven't succeeded. But, you know, I have a couple of other tri tricks down my sleeve, and, and this is just one of many problems that keep me busy. Um, but over the years, I have designed a few quantum algorithms, a few pieces of quantum software that should enable a future quantum computer to solve certain computational problems in a time that is uh, very reasonable, but that currently cannot be solved even with the world's largest supercomputer. So if we succeed one day in building a quantum computer, some of the software I came up with uh, could be used to understand some complex molecular reaction or maybe some piece of uh, quantum material or advanced material. And these, in turn, you know, could turn into new drug design or new energy transport. I don't know. And honestly, I don't really care. You see, when I do research, I'm not motivated by these potential applications. I just want to understand the fundamental power that quantum mechanics offers in terms of computing. And uh, sometimes I work on a problem and I realize that this problem cannot possibly benefit from a quantum computational speed up. And this might be surprising to you, but in terms of, you know, like personal fulfillment, this is equally rewarding as finding a new application, because in both cases, I learned something new about quantum mechanics. So I think this is possibly the hallmark of intellectual freedom. It's having the, the luxury or the freedom or the privilege of asking a question without a priori any preference for what the answer should be. We just want to know the answer. So of course, coming up with new quantum software and new quantum algorithms requires some technical skills and knowledge. You need to understand how a quantum computer operates and, and what are the, the underlying logic of, a, of quantum, quantum information. Uh, but I think that by far the most important ingredient is creative thinking. So you have to take a, 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 a problem uh, uh, that we use computers to solve and understand the mathematical structure of it and try to understand how you can grab this problem and make it amenable to a quantum computer. <coughs> Uh, so, um, so in fact, uh, the idea, the, the creative thinking is not only important today, but it's, um, uh, the, the very idea of building a quantum computer began when a few very marginal researchers had the, had the courage of asking a very bold question. The, cur the question they ask is the following, uh, <clears throat> how can quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics is this very counterintuitive theory 
that explains the atomic and subatomic world. So how can quantum mechanics change the way in which we exchange and process information? So to understand just how crazy this question is, you need to know that quantum mechanics had always been restricted to the atomic scale. Okay? You, don't need a qu you don't need quantum mechanics to explain how uh, a tennis ball will bounce around or how airplanes fly. These are explained by Newtonian classical mechanics. So suggesting that a human scale system, like a computer, could utilize the, the strange features of the quantum universe was delusional when it was first suggested in the 1980s. Yet today, we have major corporation, government, and venture capitalists investing billions of dollars to build a quantum computer. This picture shows IBM's latest attempt. You can even play with it. You could access it on the cloud if you'd like. <clears throat> so of course, these industrial players are primarily interested in harnessing and, and harvesting, sorry, the tremendous computational power of quantum information, but they also recognize that without intellectual freedom, this power would never have been unleashed, okay? So organizations like CIFAR help us stay vigilant and, at protecting our right to ask very tricky and risky questions. And our CIFAR program, the Quantum Information Science Program, has been largely shaped by another very risky question. The question is, what do we learn about fundamental physics by thinking about physical systems, whether it's an airplane, this remote, or, or a black hole, or whatnot, as an information processing unit? So this might, may sound like a strange question, and it deserves explanation. So uh, of course, we're used to think of information as something immaterial. Think about the password to my smartphone. This has nothing to do with physics, does it? But the reality is that any information requires a physical system, whether it's my brain, my, my, a hard drive in my phone, or ink on a piece of paper. There can be no information without physical support. And this has consequences. <clears throat> so uh, to give you a simple example, you know that no physical body can travel faster than the speed of light. Therefore, a consequence is that you cannot send information. Information cannot be transmitted faster than the speed of light because information needs to be supported by a physical system. So this is an example of how the laws of physics impose constraints on the laws and the rules of information. But what we like to do now is turn this picture around and say, how do the rules of information processing affect the universe in which we live? The upshot of this is that information is universal. So if, the, if you discover that there's a fundamental limit on some information processing task, this puts a limit, a physical constraint, on every possible embodiment of that information. So information theory is really universal, and it, it cross, cuts across physics. So you could be studying, say, electronic correlation in a piece of superconductor, and you discover a new information pattern there. And you can transpose this information pattern to something like a black hole and learn entirely new, new physics there. So, and I'm not just saying that because that example I just gave was one of the crown achievement of our CIFAR program in the past five years. We took the knowledge we have of quantum information to shed new light on some of the deepest questions in physics, including the black hole evaporation paradox. This is where the two pillars of modern physics, quantum mechanics and general relativity, collide. <clears throat> so enough maybe about these achievements. Uh, uh, so you all know that information technologies have transformed our society in a very deep way. It's also transformed the way we pursue knowledge. And I believe that this trend will continue. I wouldn't be surprised that uh, soon the, the information theoretic perspective will affect many, if not all, areas of science. And maybe uh, it will even blur the, the boundary between, uh, between scientific disciplines, you know? The, the way we currently organize research is by saying, oh, you know, this is uh, uh, humanity, this is life science, this is uh, physical science, but maybe in the future, we will organize research in terms of what information processing is this research concerned with? So here's 
here's maybe some information, some correlation structure that shows up in the human genome. And the same pattern shows up in economics. So these people should be working together because in terms of information perspective, they're working on the same problem. So you might think that this kind of idea sounds completely crazy, but that's precisely why I'm here. So thank you, <laughs> and have a good evening.